It's so many new faces for me. Um, and first of all, welcome to you guys um, for coming to this session on community building and welcome to Lawrence. Is there special guest hands together for Lawrence? Um, so Lawrence, I'm gonna ask you to do your own intro actually, but I just thought I wanted to share why I thought you would be the perfect person to talk about this, this, this thing called like community building around our ideas for change because you are, it's both your job to uh, help people design and launch businesses that do good and make them happy. And of course, there's this dreaded aspect then of having to put your ideas out there and build community around them. And then the second is that you actually yourself are building community around um, your idea for change, which is a happy startup school. So you're both the teacher as well as the practitioner, which is my favorite combination because I like people who walk their talk. Um, mm -hmm. Welcome, good to see you. Thank you, Anne and everyone, for inviting me here today and also to see all the lovely, well, spread of people across the world. It's really exciting to, to know who's in the room. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, so I'd, I'd love to ask everyone who's part of this call today, let us know in the chat what you would like to learn um, from this session. So if you're, do you have an idea? Do you have a business? Do you have a product or service? Are you trying to put it in front of people? Or are you simply like looking curious, looking to pick up some ideas? Like what brought you here? So we can bring that into the conversation. Um, I guess my, my, my first question for you, Lawrence, um, I'm just, so you, have you you run the happy startup school that started as an idea that between you and carlos um can you by way of introduction take us back of um where that started um and uh, how that got you to today mm. okay cool thanks sam um so carlos is my co-founder i don't know if he's joined us in the call if he does you may well heckle me in the chat so uh, look out for that um he's uh been my business partner in different guises for wow 18 years now we first started our first business in 2004 um but before that we were friends so we actually went to school together going back to when we were seven years old so in some ways when I look back I think my grounding in, in community really started from my my school experience and my my childhood really being brought up in a diverse part of West London with lots of different cultures and uh, nationalities and Carlos is a Filipino family I'm an Irish family my best friends from all walks of life all different um, parts of the world and we went to a Catholic school so that was kind of our, our I guess our upbringing was in lots of different ideas lots of different food lots of different um, ways of thinking about the world um, and so when we set out in business together we didn't really start to or aim to create a community at all really it was um probably almost 10 years into the journey of running our agency. So a bit like you, our, ba our background was in uh, sort of design. Well, my more in design, Carlos is more in the uh, technology space. And we started a, a web design studio together and that was our first company. And we did that for close to 10 years. Um, but on that journey, I think we, if I look back, I, I think we really had a, a need to belong. I think a lot of business people we meet, whether they're a small business or bigger or even just solopreneurs or freelancers um it can be quite a lonely road and when we were running our first business i definitely recall us going to loads of networking events and conferences um partly because we just wanted to get clients and better clients but i think also we were trying to find people like us who ran businesses and, and to be honest we struggled with that really we didn't really feel at home in some of the um, spaces we were in we either had to look bigger than we were there was just two of us running the company at the start and so you know when you're starting out you want to look bigger than you are to just try and get the best clients attract the best employees and hopefully um yeah build your network um but yeah we made loads of mistakes going to the wrong kinds of events the wrong kinds of um networks and in some ways i think our community is almost a result of us not really feeling at home in other people's networks and not really finding what we wanted from from you know that need to belong really and so you know accidentally we uh, had this idea for the happy startup school put some ideas out there and off the back of that organically we started to meet some really amazing people and they ended up mm -hmm. becoming you know much closer to us and then from there we started to work out okay is this a thing and do we want to lead this thing do we want to actually take this forward as a as a community but also as a business because at the time we were running an agency and it wasn't our main uh, focus so 
in 2015, we, we made the call to close the agency to focus fully on the Happy Startup School. After a year or so of, of experimenting and, and dabbling you know, as a side hustle. And again, going back to what you said, this is the point at which we find a lot of people we now mentor and coach who are part of our community who really get to a point where they're at a turning point in their career or business where they, they want to decide, do I stick and twist or do I go do this really purposeful thing that's calling me or do I stay in my safe little you know comfort zone that I'm in at the moment? And so in some ways, us having experienced it ourselves give us um, at least the empathy to understand what does it take to to make a difficult decision and to decide to lean into community really, which is I guess the heart of this conversation what I what I understand from from what you're or what I'm taking away from what you're saying is that it community is you stumbled into because you were looking for belonging rather than that you sat at a table and you drew the blueprint for this mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I think Carlos would have liked me or us to do that <laughs> Carlos is by his own admission, much more uh, the organizer, I'm more the ideas person. Um, and so I tend to sort of shoot from the hip more. And Carlos, you know, I remember in the early days would always be looking for a plan, which, you know, was a healthy thing to ask for and to always question me about the ideas I had certainly to, to kickstart this thing. Um, but yeah, it wasn't a strategic move. Let's just, <laughs> let's call it that. And to be honest, we, when we were running our agency, we were actually, the business evolved into creating platforms like web platforms for clients like apps and um, online communities and so we ended up um, developing for clients online communities and understanding that actually with all the best laid plans you know it's impossible to get people to do things that they don't want to do and so you know we could design an amazing experience and get everything all lined up in terms of what the client thought was a great community but actually if the appetite wasn't there from the people who were part of it or they got it slightly wrong or it seemed like a thinly veiled sales pitch to buy something then it just didn't work so you know i think that as well made us realize yes you can do some planning but equally you'll only find out through experimenting and, and talking to people actually about what it is that they want as well as what you want so for the people who go through the uh, happy startup school process so i imagine that you work with individuals who are coming up with an idea and that idea somehow needs to make it into the world. So at what stage do you feel like an idea is ready for sharing? Is it ever too early um, to put an idea out there in the world? <clears throat> well, I think this is something that, um, <clears throat> sorry, frog my throat, something that I'd probably say more than anything else is, is start before you're ready, um, which I'm pretty sure would be one of the mantras that I'm sure you, you um, share with your people who are trying to build brands you know it's easy to hide yourself away and design the perfect brand or community or product or business and i think as humans it's natural to want to do that to get things as good as we can get them before presenting it to people it can be really scary to show something that's you know half baked or even not quite as good as you want it to be um but i've found partly through trial error and experience that you know a, it can be really disheartening when you spend a lot of time on something and the world doesn't want it or need it. And, and that's, you know, soul destroying and also can be quite expensive financially and energetically. And uh, I've certainly spent way too long in the past on whether it's our own ideas or other people's ideas that just, you know, we're never going to work. And so best to find that out sooner than later, I would say, on that side of things. Um, but I think the other side of it is when you can show some vulnerability and you know, share an idea that's not fully formed. I found actually that can be an amazing way to connect people much more so than if something's fully formed, polished yeah. and completed. And so it's almost this merry dance between, you know, want to present something that's credible and that could just be words. It doesn't need to be an amazing, you know, video or brand or product. It can just be a story, um, but it seems credible enough for people to want to find out more or be curious. Um, and to open up a conversation or invite people to an event. I'm sure we can talk about some ways people can do this, but there's ways to bring people together in a way that maybe isn't the eventual thing this becomes, but is a way to go on that journey together. And so, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of sharing ideas before they're ready, which is what we did with the Happy Startups, but it wasn't something we did as a strategy. It was more just from the inside out almost. We had ideas that we wanted to share. We had frustrations that we had 
about entrepreneurship and business. And it came from that place of genuine interest in improving things, really. And, and luckily, there were other people out there who felt the same. So unless you put those ideas out there, unless we put those ideas out there, we'd never have found those people. Yeah. Um, and in many ways, people, I think, have warmed to our story because they've been connected to it from an early stage and they feel like they've followed it as well, which I think makes it more appealing for people to join at the early stage rather than when everything's all, all worked out. Mm. The way that you're, you're, that you describe how to build a movement, which is more about like, hey, you know, you have an idea, you're starting a conversation with people, for me, makes it a lot less threatening. Um, and I, I saw a post um, from you a while ago that where you broke it down really wonderfully on LinkedIn, like six, basically six simple steps, which started with that idea. Do you know those six steps by heart by any chance? <laughs> yeah, I hope you've got them in front of you. I could probably have a stab at it, but um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pretty sure the first thing would just be to just share it in the most accessible, simple way that you know for you and maybe where your audience or an audience currently is. Um, and I found words to be an amazing way to do that. And not everyone does. Some people would like to or prefer to maybe record a video or an audio message, whatever it is. It doesn't necessarily need to be broadcast to everyone. It could just be to one or a handful of people who you think you'd like to hear this message. Um, and I found that to be useful not just to communicate something to them, but actually to get clear yourself about what it is you're trying to do. So trying to craft the words to explain a vision or an idea about a community or a movement, whatever you want to call it, um, actually I found is an amazing route to clarity because you then start to really break down your ideas and communicate it in a more simple, accessible way. Um, so that'd be one thing. And I think just making it really easy for people to um, to invite them to something, whatever that thing is, whether it's an email, whether it's a message on WhatsApp, whether it's a meetup group was one of the things we did when we first started, you know, give people an easy way to take action to, to join you on this thing, whatever this thing becomes. And, and just to make those steps super simple. So it's not, um, you know, email me if you're interested or, you know, you know, making the, the kind of speed hump too big, you know, make it super simple for them to get in touch. And then from there, you can start to, again, the classic startup thing of iterate, improve, while you learn really what it is that you want to create and also what is it that people want to to receive one of the very helpful um reframes that the community aspect brings is i feel like we think about it less as like audiences that need to be targeted and actually much more about relationship building which is so important early on well at any stage really where you're trying to figure out like you know what do people need? Like, does this resonate? Like you need to have those conversations. And I think when you start out thinking about people that you need to get on board to make this bigger and better, when you think about them as audiences with like a target on their forehead, <laughs> uh, that, that just creates a completely different dynamic than having conversations with people and, you know, using their talents and strengths and knowledge and insight to make something better. I think it's just really a, really nice different way of thinking about building a product or a business um than like the traditional marketing kind of brand way of thinking yeah about and i remember when we started out like i said one of the first things we did this is like 2012 so <clears throat> almost a decade ago now was was start a meetup group um and that was in london and it was before we even did an event it was a useful tool to learn actually about who's who's signing up to the group so before we even Put an event on there we, we start the meetup group we had to explain what it was about the happy startup school meetup and so people saw it and then we asked them a couple of questions when they signed up because you can do that on meetup i'm pretty sure you still can and so that was a filter to understand you know do people post a picture because that was another requirement we had do they answer these questions and it was as simple as what brings you here you know what piques your interest about this group so even just those little you know points of data almost were useful signals to us that there's something interesting here what people are telling us um and i approached those those people and just said do you want to have a quick chat and so within a couple of weeks of starting that meetup group i'd probably had 10 conversations that um saved me a lot of time number one but also built some uh, connections with people that are, you know would have taken months otherwise and, and learned a lot about what is it people are interested in before we did our first event and then from there we even had our first 10 people to come on that on that event so it was almost 
a good way to you know get people to commit i guess more than just i'm a number i'm another meetup group but actually these people care and there's a genuine person behind this this brand you know which i think is like what you're saying it's that thing which we say a lot which is do things that don't scale you know at the beginning don't always worry about how would this work when we've got a thousand members and maybe you'll still do when you've got a thousand members but the idea of just taking the slow approach and having those conversations that might take time but you'll learn so much through those so you use the word brand which is like a major trigger for me of course so uh, because i think one of the interesting things when we're discussing this topic is is there is a like i think there are communities that become so strong that they become brands in in themselves um there are brands that thrive and build community um like early days of and um i think what's interesting is that when we're thinking about building community there is a role for brands but um I think very often that comes potentially as an afterthought, but do you see a clear connection between community building and brand building? Um, or have you seen that with the Happy Startup School? I think it's a difficult one for me because, uh, you know, a lot of the people in our community and the people we work with tend to be small, you know, whether they're sort of companies of one or small teams, um, or, or, you know, we get the other people who work for or with bigger brands and bigger companies. But I'd say that the exception rather than the rule. So, which I, I suppose to some degree is why community for them becomes more inval invaluable because you haven't got a big team around you. So, you know, you need that feeling of being part of something. <clears throat> I think for me, I always say to people, and again, this is why I find it hard to talk about brands, brand communities, let's say, because A, I don't have much involvement with them from the inside but also be i'm a big believer in community building is hard it's not an easy gig and so if you're leading one if it's not uh, something you want for yourself it's going to be even harder um and it's, it's like running a business and you know, a lot of people think they want to start a business but like you were saying before not many people want to put the work in to to actually have that you know so whether it's like you said earlier learning an instrument you know everyone wants to be able to learn an instrument but not everyone has the time or energy or commitment to actually do it do the hard gig so i think with community building for me it's you know when i say to people about building a community is do you want a community or do you actually want to spend the hard hours long hours building one and nurturing one and growing one because it is a way of life for me more than it is a role and, and I know there are people who run communities for brands and it's not it's a bad thing to do it's just I personally think everyone who's leading that in some way needs to feel mm -hmm. some need for that themselves so whether it's a need to belong or there's a need to um, I don't know express themselves creatively within it I think there needs to be that that balance between I'm doing this for the company versus I'm doing this for myself and um, yeah me and Carlos started this not to lead a community we needed community ourselves and so that's why it's powerful I think for us is because every time we run an event or run a program or host any sort of space or we connect people who don't know each other that we get a buzz off that ourselves because that's what we love doing um, and that's something in our DNA and I don't think that would ever go away and so I think that's just for people to to have that sort of gut check almost when they're thinking about building communities what's in it for me really you know not thinking selfishly but actually thinking how can I stop myself from burning out when this gets really hard and I'm feeling overwhelmed and again we've had conversations about this about the to-do list keeps growing there's always more things you could do and should do and feel the need to do and the more your community grows the more you know that just grows with it and so yeah having boundaries around that knowing what's in it for you as well as knowing what your red lines are as a team, as a leader, I think is super important because otherwise, and again, there's probably examples we could share. I've seen how some brands on the outside talk the talk, but on the inside, the culture can be a bit toxic. And I don't think that's something that any community should encourage because otherwise I think eventually the brand will get caught up by the culture and people find out what's going on in the inside and it's not always mm -hmm. rosy. So um, yeah, I think in the past you could probably 
have a great picture on the outside and no one would ever know what happens within an organization or a community but more and more now is everything's much more transparent which i think is a good thing yeah so for instance if you're thinking about let's say that um communities kind of need so they gather around the central idea or something that we all recognize like a purpose we all connect to or a sense of identity that we connect to when you think of um, the happy startup school um, how do you go through that process of like getting to some sort of core of that flag that you want people to gather around mm. um, was it easy because you guys are just to make the bridge to brand and you guys are for instance really good i think at um, articulating that that identity and that belonging really well um, the way you name stuff um, what things look like, the kind of people you gather around. So it feels like a very, in that sense, happy startup school feels like a very strong brand. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, is that a, that, that's also a talent, right? Like being able to keep that simplicity when lots of people are gathering around, being able to hold and guard that core of the purpose and the identity. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm curious if that came very natural and that if that process has been easy to sustain over the years or mm. kind of... it, it can be easy to make things complicated. I know that it can be really easy to, to, uh, keep adding more things and, um, and eventually look at the whole and you're like, how does this all fit together? So that's something we, we've certainly struggled with in the more recent times is as we've grown, as we've done more things, um, you know, individually, they might make sense as brands, but then when you try and tie them together, it can feel a bit more disjointed. So that's the kind of work we're on at the moment is, you know, we do a summer camp, which is an annual retreat for close to 200 people every, every September, um, which again, no one's done for two weeks and no one's done the events for two years, but it's coming back this year. Um, we do online programs. We have an online community. We've done retreats around the world in different places. We do coaching. So all of these things, yeah, individually might make sense, but the Happy Startup School for us is almost like an umbrella for that in terms of all these different spaces. Um, and and in, in our heads, it makes perfect sense, but there's different entry points for people. And so not everyone knows all these individual parts exist. Um, but yeah, I would say, yes, our background was making stuff, designing um, products, designing websites, designing brands. Um, so we, in some ways, our apprenticeship was... 10 to 15 years of running an agency and doing it for other people um and i remember at the time meeting a lot of other agency founders and designers and technologists who had also got to a point of like i loved this work but i'm fed up doing it for other people <laughs> you know i'm I've, I've learned all these skills and someone one of our mentors and friends at the time said something to me which stuck in my head which was running an agency is an amazing education but it's no way to live your life um which really hurt at the time because that's what our, our, our kind of business was based around um but i think what you meant was you know eventually you've got a creative side to you that you want to channel into something maybe your own vision not everyone wants to but i certainly had this vision that i wanted to see come to life and so for me that felt easier than than not doing it um but i'd also say we've learned a lot over the years in terms of actually simplifying things to the point of not being so perfectionist about how things look or the perfect name or you know um getting all the the perfect team on board to build this thing and actually understanding that yeah doing something not quite perfect is, is actually like i said earlier a good way to to connection and, and speed sometimes can be a powerful tool to to actually get things going rather than here's the brief let's go spend six to 12 months building it and then find out the world's the world's moved on so yeah we've learned the hard way that um it can be difficult when things don't go to plan so best to try and learn as quick as you can and and actually in some cases swallow your pride about this amazing thing you think you've got when actually no one cares so um yeah <laughs> that's always the kick in the guts um when you have an idea that you think is amazing but no one else quite connects with and and sometimes the opposite can be true too one of the um things that i've noticed for brand the change and i'm curious when you're talking about this umbrella um is that it's really extremely helpful in terms of purpose and identity to understand like 
building brand around the community for me is like um, a way to make choices. So we know what is for us and what is not for us. So the Seth Godin thing of like people like us do things like this very much applies there. What are some of the ways that you try and reinforce, let's say, or can you even reinforce like happy startup school community? So are there certain values that you really believed in that you put in place mm. and that other members um, share or strengthen or add to? Yeah, I don't know if we explicitly lay this out enough actually i mean it's probably something we should do more of um and again you know you've done it on the start of this call there we, there carlos has already jumped in before me um i think in some ways what we try and do i think is 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 model the behaviors we want people to exhibit in the community and so it's less here's the kind of rule book of how to how to show up I, i'd hope it's how we show up sort of gives people a guide on how they they should operate um and so something we see happen more and more, which I don't think was there at the start, was actually by us letting go maybe of some of the um, some of the vision in some ways for particularly the online community, like letting it sort of bubble up more from the ground up rather than us telling people how things should work has actually, I think, strengthened it. And so we're seeing a lot more friendships and collaboration and contribution between people you know without us having to be there which is i think what community is about is um and i think in the past because we were growing and it it felt like it always needed me and carlos to drive it or maybe we thought it needed us to drive it but actually it didn't it just needed us to create the space and and, and get out of the way at certain times so um and, and likewise at our summer camp you know me and carlos aren't front and central to the the whole operation we have someone who hosts the whole weekend we the last few weeks uh, summer camps i don't think we've even run a workshop but we just love talking to people and i certainly do love those more intimate conversations and getting to know people on a, a small you know one-to-one -one or a small group level so i think for me it's about creating the conditions creating the experience um is important for me um <laughs> carlos loves to be a showman so he'd be on stage all the time um but yeah i i, I get a buzz out of designing experiences and i think this is one of the things maybe we can touch on is what helps to build community particularly at the beginning i found is shared experiences whether that's a call like this whether that's um like i said a meetup group it could be a, a course it could be anything but something that allows people to have a shared experience together whether it's 10 minutes or a week you know those are the things that i've seen accelerate community more than anything else um and once you've got that shared experience, I mean, me and Carlos are part of a, another leadership group where they came off the back of, a, I think, a do lectures course. And that's been going for 18 months now. We didn't even do that course. We came in later. But the core of that community was built upon people who had a, a strong learning journey together. And they went on that journey. And therefore, on the end of it, the natural thing is, and I'm sure you get this too, you do an event. The thing people say at the end is, how do we stay in touch? You know, you go to a good event. That's always the natural thing that people want to do is let's stay in touch and I guess it's up to people to lead communities to be able to make that next thing easier because we found people really struggle to do it on their own because life gets in the way and we don't have the capacity to do it so as Seth would say you know the world needs you or your people need you just go start to lead um so yeah that's the the role of a community builder I guess mm. um there was a there was a question earlier like how do you hold the balance between building a, you know, wonderful, supportive community that really represents like shared interest and shared value and that works for everyone involved and also be building a healthy business and realizing those things are not necessarily um, always easy to align or mutually exclusive. It's a great question. Um... It's a, it's a question that I think we struggle with for a long time is, is, you know, is our job to build a community and try and monetize it? And I hate that term, but, you know, that's the kind of strategies. Like we get all these people together, we, you know, build this big um, audience and then we try and turn this into a community and we, we find a way to monetize it. So 
whether it's crowdfunded, or we have subscription model or some membership model, those would be the standard ways to make that work. Um, and so in some ways, I think for us, it was challenging because like I said, we didn't set out to start a community. It wasn't part of some big grand plan, some big sort of strategy that we had. And so we were very much following this emergent journey to understand A, how does this community work, but also B, how does this business work? Um, and before we ran a very sort of straightforward business and it had a clear business model, you know, we sold our services to clients who paid for our time. Um, if we wanted to hire more people, we had to either increase our rates or get more clients. And that's what we did. And so over time, you start to build a team, build a bigger team. You can see this kind of growth trajectory in front of you, um, which, to be honest, by the end for us, wasn't as exciting as, what, as it was in the beginning. So that's why we ended up not going on to that next stage of growing that company. Um, but it did mean we then went into a different journey, which was much more exciting and adventurous, but also a bit more scary, too, in terms of what does the business look like? And so, um, you know, we've gone on this journey to a explore what does the business look like and iterate towards products and programs and experiences that we can sell. Um, but also off the back of all those experiences, community keeps getting formed and new people come in. And so then it's like, how do we keep the community connected year round? And so we have an online community. Our on online community definitely doesn't cover the cost of running it, but um, what it does do is gives a gives us a lot more you know connection ourselves year round particularly during covid and i'm sure you guys have found this too you know communities like yours are so important when we're all stuck in our mm. bedrooms and houses for so long and and it's it highlights the value of these communities um but also b when we come to do the things that we end up charging people for people are ready and waiting because they've met online and they want to go and meet in person it's not like one competes with the other so yeah for me it's all about building relationships and so understanding sometimes people come in who never buy anything from us you know we've had people follow us for five years and they come on their first event um and some people might have read all of our blog posts and never even responded to an email that's fine we understand that's part of the journey and you know some things scale on and don't need to pay back and and other things don't and we're not uh, I don't think we're precious about that, really. Everyone's everyone's a, a member in some ways, whether they give us money or not, which is, uh, I guess, a different way to look at it rather than these are loyal customers who always buy lots of things from us. Um, and whether I'm, or me and Carlos or any of them, anyone in the community, whether we're getting paid a lot of money to do a coaching session or we're getting paid nothing and doing the same thing, that doesn't really, it doesn't really change the, the rules of the game for me. Mm as long as I can pay for the roof over my head and uh, feed my kids and have a nice life. And I'm happy really. Mm. Enough for a walk in the mountains. Yeah. I'm that too. <laughs> so I'm sure that Carl Carlos is, is chattering away in the, in the chat as well, but um, in terms of the, the, like putting a price on like the sense of belonging. Um, I think that's for a lot of people that's a really difficult challenge um and carlos runs the happy pricing course i'm sure he has lots of ideas around this um but was it a was it a big step for you to say like okay well we have this group of people and the community is actually a product it's not a nice byproduct or it's not a nice but it is a service community as a service mm. that we're providing and that we're building that we're obviously putting an immense amount of time into. Was that a big step for you guys to take and actually say like, okay, well, you know, but we have to put some sort of financial label on this in order to be able to do the work that we're doing. Mm. Um, I would say, I mean, Carlos has alluded to it there. I would say, you know, most of the activities we do solve a problem more so than a different problem to to creating belonging let's say so whilst the value of a lot of the things that we do are um result in people being connected to each other and then the community is the byproduct of it almost you know content or experiences are at the forefront and so we i think we've always tried to start with that rather than start with community so because i don't think people 
necessarily and i might be wrong are out there looking to pay money to be part of communities um and again it goes back to that shared experiences thing like why, why am i here why are we here what is it we're trying to do whether it is as clear as there's a business problem i'm trying to solve i.e i want to learn how to like with the course that um we're running at the moment is pricing course how can i price more powerfully is a clear problem to solve you know i'm not getting paid my worth um there's no margin in the work i do and i i'm struggling and feeling a bit stressed and burnt out you know how can i make business feel easier for me that's a clear problem so people will come on that course there'll be a small cohort and by the end of it people will feel super connected because they've been sharing stories about money and all their deepest fears and hopes and dreams and that's a connecting experience because a they're sharing the similar values of people who aren't necessarily money hungry business people they are people who like us are more driven by change and impact but also know that money is so important to the success of any venture whether it's a non-profit or profit for profit so um i think we we lead with those kinds of things more a bit like if we do the retreat in the alps we do we lead with the experience of it and the need for space the need for nature the need for um uh, clarity and, and connection with others is, is a part of that but the shared wisdom the knowledge that's being shared and also being away in an amazing place with nice people for a week is what we lead with um and the one thing that people will say at the end is how amazing all the people were the community we've built the vibe we've created but again that's not necessarily what they're paying for at the beginning so that's always the the tricky sort of balance i guess you've got to strike with this is do you lead with community and we've had this kind of existential crisis for years now it's like are you a community or are you a school and which one do you lead with mm. um and it's a good question because and this is something our mentors of the years have, have grilled us about and and we are both but it makes it difficult when someone asks you what do you do and i'm sure you get this too you don't have a stock answer for this for everyone well i think what's so interesting about your what you're saying is that this is at the heart of the whole like brand to change brand develop method is you you have to if you want to get people on board with your idea for change you have to lead with what matters to them um, and that's not to say that you shouldn't lead with what's really important to you, but if it's only important to you and it doesn't match um, what matters to other people, it can fall flat. And so actually what you're saying about like what brings what what brings people in is you you have this niggly, like what brought me into the happy start of community. I have this problem with this business model that I just can't crack or um, Zaylin is on this call. Uh, I met Zaylin at a school for creative leadership um, 10 years ago. And I went there um, also on a quest for a certain business model. And I made lots of friends and I actually met my husband and I, that's how I started this company. But that I wasn't going there for those reasons. And I think that's what's very interesting about this community question and about all the different types of products and ideas for change that we're trying to build is like what like at first you have to work from your own intuition and then when you're opening it up to more people you get those different perspectives and you can really enrich it and also start to figure out like okay well maybe we need to switch a little bit how we're leading this because it resonates better with people uh yeah, yeah community, community as a matchmaking service um so one of the joys and i think also just to be perfectly honest the total pain in the ass of like running a community is you've got a lot of fantastic feedback and the big pain is that you get a lot of fantastic feedback <laughs> um and um so like the borders of your initiative when other people come in and throw their ideas into this like they can really start to stretch so um are you guys a democracy or are you a <laughs> dictatorship um does everything come from emergence or is there also a very clear stop I mean, is this the, mo like, the moment where we need people who are here from our community to respond to that rather than it come from me uh if any of them are still around um i, I hate the thought of being a dictatorship um <clears throat> i think that's is that thing of i think i mentioned it earlier of one of the challenges but also one of the needs i think of any any community is to be able to let go um as something i've really struggled with over the years is like i've at the start very protective of the brand we've created and the, the you know the the heart that's gone into it and the work that's gone into it and so you know when we um probably about five years ago we had people who came to our summer camp and wanted to start chapters around the world 
And so that was a moment for me where I was like, okay, I really want this to grow. I really believe in what we're doing and that this can be something that can help lots of people in lots of different places. But that definitely took a, a sort of letting go of, you know, people are going to do it their own way and they're going to add their own spin to it, both in terms of culturally, locally, but also they'll do things that I wouldn't do or we wouldn't do. And, but they're using our brand to, to, to build that. And so that for me was when I was like, well, being a dictator here is not helpful because it will never happen, number one. And two, I don't know what people in Sydney want or people in Israel want, you know, so who am I to say what, what should go down there? All we can do is use our brand as a way to bring people to that space and allow the, the chapter lead to, to do it how they want to. So I think that's when I realized, like, if we want this thing to grow, it's got to be a lot more, you know, dynamic and living than it is if we just plan it out and hand over a Bible of how to do this stuff. Because um, there's no fun in it then for anyone, I don't think. And so now I think um, it's a bit of a balance between having a clear idea of what this could be and the, like you said, the values and the ethos and the, the vision behind it. But also I think for people to just add their own flavor to it. And, you know, the nice thing about our online communities now, we have so many different events going on that I'd never have imagined would be needed or wanted or be valuable, but they seem to work because someone in the community wants them to happen and other people rally around that vision but it's all within that bigger container. And I think that's the, um, yeah, that, that's the part of this journey I've enjoyed is just understanding uh, when do we need to host and step in and when do we need to step back? And I think that at the beginning, we're probably too trying to micromanage everything. Yeah. And that, that wasn't helpful, I don't think, for the growth of the community. Talking about letting go and taking a step back, so I'll definitely open up the floor for, for other people who have questions. Um, but I just wanted to also respond to something that Carlos is saying in the chat. So talking about like starting with a clear vision, which which I, I think what you were saying, um, Lawrence, about like putting this idea out into the world, like, hey, this is the change that I want to see, or this is the idea that I have. What do you think? Let's start talking. Um, but also those values, what, what I find really interesting about that, that's very kind of like traditional um, brand speak, um, but... I think actually what's really interesting is like in a way like community and brand are very similar in that there's this kind of, there's a social, there is a sort of social contract that you have created um, within the Happy Startup School that might not be incredibly um, specific, but has emerged around some sort of leadership from you and Carlos um, where you're mentioning like, hey, how we show up and how we model the behavior that we we hope to see um, is is very um, is very present there. So I guess what I find interesting in that from a brand building perspective, like everything that we do around, like hey, just getting better articulating why are we here, and what brings us together, what are we here to do, like that exercise can be potentially very helpful if you're building community because looking at it through a brand lens kind of just mm. puts that those elements in place that you might necessarily think of as brand, but um, yeah, but that I feel like are almost one-on-one, -on -one, um, mm. the same for community as, as with brand. Yeah, and I wouldn't, um, I suppose I'd like to raise the, the point of content for us as well, and content being whether it's blogs or talks or uh, webinars or whatever, over the years, particularly at the beginning, I think, you know, that was a huge driver of people to, to us and actually without saying these are our values the way we would communicate the way we would talk about what was important to us that was almost a filter for people for our philosophy ultimately and so I found that really interesting at the start people say I really align with the happy startup school values and I was like well, where have you read them you know thinking that they've just like <laughs> seen them somewhere because I'd like to see them because I don't think I've written them down anywhere um but what they did do, I suppose, was they really connected with something that we were saying and it really spoke to them. And so through that, there was people who read it who it didn't connect with and that's fine, but they didn't come along to the events. They didn't, mm. you know, um, join the community. And so it is that Marmite thing. I don't know if Marmite's a big thing in Kenya, but, you know, it's, you know, really talking it's to people. With who... British Kenyans, every okay. safari lodge you go to, there'll be either a bovine or a marmite jar on the table. And I keep just okay. telling them, like, Kenya should be free of this kind of, you know, tabletop colonialism of, of our of our economy. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I know Australians have Vegemite. I don't know if there's any, any Aussies here. Um, but yeah, it's that thing of, you know, I think even Seth Godin says, isn't he? Talk to everyone and you talk to no one. So, you know, not that we were trying to filter out people who were the wrong fit, but by talking what about what was important to us, that, again, it talks about values, but in what well, it could be in design or words or visuals whatever it is those things become a connector and so yeah i don't think we've um sort of done it in a traditional way but i suppose it's still achieved the same goal hopefully and it's very rare that we get someone along to anything that we do that isn't the right fit it just seems to self-select in some ways um and i suppose through that word of mouth kicks in as well so if you start with those five ten people in your community you may never to do any, never ever need to do any marketing if you get it right because you know word of mouth is is the best marketing you can have so um yeah as i said creating a great experience for people and they might they might come back and i know that francis from your community is hosting an event on how to actually get more out of this word of mouth thing <laughs> oh great so, um uh so uh, again that's the power of community that you you pull people together uh, around um some, like solving some of the same problems what what um well if 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 there's someone who has a question for Carlos, please feel free to raise your digital hand and I'll call upon you next. Um just on that point of like filtering out like these are the people that belong to us, like this is the right fit and this is not. When Drew and I have been working on a project for a Kenyan community brand that has 50,000 members, and it was really interesting working with their team and talking about the brand strategy and and they came back to us and said, no, but we can't choose because, you know, we have these other groups that also like we shouldn't lose them. And I was like, no, we need to lose them. We need to like this mm -hmm. needs to attract a certain group of, of people with the right ethos and like the right type of attitude. And um, it was just I think this to me as a brand strategist feels very natural. But if you're purely thinking about it as like metric for success is the volume of my community mm. like i have 400 people right now i would be in much better shape if i have a thousand it's like well if those thousand people aren't the right people then your community is going to go to pots mm. um so i guess my question for you is like is there have you noticed as your community is growing like can you do you feel like there's a size where you can still handle like that you can feel like your the culture that's there is still that kind of supportive and warm thing. Or as you get bigger, um, does it actually get harder to to guard culture? I think the the thing about us is we don't have like one big community. We have lots of sub communities almost. Again, as a mm -hmm. result of all these different things that we've done. So we have our summer camp group. We have our Vision Twenty Twenty groups. Um, see you later, Pauline. Good to see you here. Um, we have, um, yeah, just different communities, again, based on some shared experiences that people have. And some people engage with one thing. Like, for example, some people come to summer camp and we never see them until the next summer camp. You know, they don't engage with the online community at all. But that doesn't mean they're not part of the community. Mm. And likewise, there's people very active in the, in the online community year round, as well as really passive people as well who are still part of it and, and have value, but they're not as vocal. So I find that interesting because it's, you know, it's not like every member is, has the same kind of impact on, you know, it growing because not everyone is going to contribute in the same way. Um, I mean, Carlos put 150 there because I think, A, that's the size of our summer camp where we get landed on, but also it's Dunbar's number. You know, it's known to be the sort of group size that humans gravitate towards. And I think, you know, we would all struggle to name more than 150 people, particularly if yeah. a company or a, a group gets to that size. And so... Yeah. I think there is something about being able to know everyone's name is a simple metric. Um, the ego is to me wants to have huge numbers because it's like, wouldn't it be amazing to have this huge community of people making a big impact around the world. But for me, we would lose that intimacy. And so in some ways I'd rather keep it small and have people come and go or kind of as life unfolds, they, they sort of harness the community and then move on or, you know, are there more passive from afar? I don't think you can have a core that's huge and, and give equal value to everyone um, unless you have a big team, which we don't. And so that's another, it's another, I guess, part of that journey. You know, we decided what enough looks like for us. And like you said, you know, I'm sure everyone's got that figure. Um, 
but for us yeah the thought of managing all of those relationships and everything just feel would feel overwhelming for me to be be in the thousands like that we've got a big following and that's what i think that's the difference we can have lots of people reading our stuff but i think actually yeah having people as part of the community i think is, is more challenging if it's big numbers yeah I, I i know that there are like the three circles of connection where it's like yeah these are your best friends then there's the like fans and then there's the acquaintances and um i can imagine that the numbers dwindle like you don't have so many best friends even if you have one yeah <laughs> so lucky, right? you have to keep um, like you can only have a handful and you have to kick one out if you get a new one in <laughs> <laughs> that would be the dutch attitude to friendship <laughs> um cool so we had a question from anna i'm not sure if we're the right people like if we're very well positioned to answer this question but she was asking early on like yeah brand communities are a big thing and um are there some um um are there examples of brands that do community really well mm -hmm. and i think maybe it's good to reframe like brands we traditionally think of big companies with big names but to me like a brand can be any sort of person organization that has just gained a place of prominence with whoever mm -hmm. is their audience like are there are there um brands that do community really well or are there community brands that you particularly look up to that we should all look into for lessons of course besides the happy story uh yeah um it's interesting. If you'd asked me a year ago, I might have said Brewdog, but I probably wouldn't say them now. Uh, they've had quite a bad rap over the last uh, few months for good reason. Um, but I think the brewery, uh, indus brewing industry, the craft brewing industry, does a very good job at this. Um, they, you know, we've got some people in our community who've built small breweries and they've crowdfunded and they've built real strong brands because it's based around a real passion for mm. for good beer, right? And so. Um, it lends itself well to um, or a creating good brands because I was chatting to one of the founders of one of them recently, you know, they even had a design competition to create the labels for the brand. So there's a really strong design aesthetic within the brewing industry. Um, and so there's loads of great, exam great examples of those kinds of companies because I think they're, um, they're, they're accessible and authentic. Um, in terms of bigger brands, I mean, the obvious ones would be People like Patagonia, um, you've got quite a big activism sort of community. Um, Hyatt Denim in Wales, they do a really good job at running events and uh, connecting people around, you know, not just the love of a denim, but they've got a really strong story about um, why that company started and, um, and it's all based around the town that they're based at. <clears throat> so the brands that sort of I admire tend to be smaller brands that feel accessible, you know, um and uh and yeah there's i was talking to my wife before this i mean the whole personal training industry nutrition industry is a, is a brand that she's been working with called vivo yeah. life and they're a, v, a vegan uh, protein powder but they they have an online university they do lots of campaigns so i think anything where there's a real strong kind of ethical or values-based uh connection point i think for people they can lend themselves to really strong communities around that because yeah naturally people gravitate around those things I don't know about you. well yeah it's interesting i mean i think traditionally in branding what like the age old example way before the community a trend um is harley davidson so mm -hmm. this idea that you know you want the jacket you want that bicycle because that's an identity that you tap into and it's like in the textbooks like your traditional textbooks it's also always given as like this is the thing that you want as a brand is for people to be so you know in love and part of the identity but then the company itself does stupid things like launch a, a line of wine coolers and the community actually has to go in and go like hey guys like what are you doing that's not that's not cool i don't want to you know i don't want to be part of a, a a brand that creates wine coolers um <laughs> And I think one of the things that you, again, to what we were talking about earlier, is that a lot of um, people want to have this community because they see kind of commercial value in it. So brands see commercial values 
and building stronger relationships with people, but it's really hard for them to really find that point of shared value. Like, yeah, but what's in it for me to have a really strong relationship with you? I don't need to have a really strong relationship with you. I just want to get the beer. I just, you know, need to have the, the pad because I'm a woman and I, have, I don't need to be part of the community mm. for this. And so I think it's just a really, within this trend, it's just a really important thing, I feel, just the same with this whole purpose trend. It's like, okay, yeah, this is a, this might be a trend, but why would you jump on this bandwagon? Like just from a total point of sincerity, like sincerely what's in it for everyone else before you go into this super complex idea of, mm. of, of, of brand building. And um, I just pasted, or I will paste it now, I pasted an interview with um, um, the uh, Wikipedia founder um, on the podcast, How I Built This. And it's just a fascinating story of how he built this very community-driven open model and like what that takes and what it means for their funding and um yeah i i think i think his story is also just i mean i think all of us use wikipedia probably several mm. times a week and how many of us are actual contributors to wikipedia and i i think yeah there's there's lots to learn there and and i think it, it, i think some of this trend of of bigger brands getting involved in this it'll be a really interesting exercise to kind of follow along with them and see how they actually deliver that real value um, mm. for people besides their own interest in this. Um, oh yeah. Tough Mud is another one. That's a good, uh, yeah. good show. Oh, and that's a good, that's a good book. So when you created a, a case study around Tough Mudder, which we haven't launched yet, but maybe we should, uh, we've been waiting actually on the Tough Mudder team to um, get their feedback out to us because we always get everything fact-checked. Um, there's a really good book, It Takes a Tribe. Um, and so yeah. I think, Lawrence, you were uh, recommending the book Tribes um, by Seth mm. Godin, um, which I also like totally loved. I read it in 2013. I don't think I would be here without that book. Mm. Um, but It Takes a Tribe is also a super nice book. And it really goes into a lot of detail around um, how um, this guy came up with this idea, like wouldn't it be fun to run a mm. race in mud and then build community around it and build a really strong brand. Um, and then unfortunately, elect very electrocute hard people hit. on the way. Yeah, and then very hard hit by um, by COVID, obviously, um, for two years. Mm, so he's since course. left the company. But yeah. Um, cool. Was there? Was have I have I missed any questions from you guys? Do you want to put or do you want to put like just a very practical thing in front of Lawrence? Um, like, hey, Lawrence, I'm building this. What would you do? How would you go about this? shy uh, <laughs> and you're not that you're not allowed to get you're not allowed to get colors up no well maybe maybe i'll have to yeah i always i like i like the force of silence in one-on-one -on -one interviews because it allows the other person to feel uncomfortable and then they feel like they have to fill the void but in groups that technique doesn't work um no but actually i think um i think Without joking, um, it is. It would be fun to actually have Carlos ask Lawrence for a bit of advice, um, but maybe we'll 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 turn that into another hangout. Um, so um, thanks so much, Lawrence, for sharing your time with us. Um, I really I really appreciate Not at it. All. Um, it's been a we pleasure. yeah. So so for those of you guys on the call who have an like an idea for a business that you really um, want to develop further, so. Uh, Lawrence um, and Carlos do the Vision 2020 program, um, which really, really, I think is amazing um, for those of you who want to kind of take that step in kind of getting um, your ideas into more tangible shape and getting it out there in the world. Um, so we'll share, we'll share a couple of links um, after the session with some of the resources that we shared um, and um, some of the links of where you can find more about Lawrence and um, have a chance to work with them potentially one on one. Thank you for the shameless promotion. Um, <laughs> well, thanks all for listening. It's been a pleasure, and um, yeah, it's lovely to be feel part of this community because um, yeah, I've been on the surface or on the outskirts listening in for a while. So uh, yeah, it's been lovely to see it in action. And one of the things that I guess 
that I thought about. So people were asking me, like, is there a sort of like battle of the communities? Like you belong to us now, you belong to us. You belong to us. Um, but I do feel like there's these very complementary spaces that each have their own unique niche. Like I feel very much like not the typical happy startup school person. Um, and and happy startup school people might feel like brand of change is not their cup of tea. Um, but it is funny how you kind of like you you overlap at some of the edges and you find each other and it's yeah. a kind of a well we need to okay. make that make that retreat in Kenya happen one day. I think that's definitely on my bucket list. <laughs> yes. And me I'll probably there. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see snow in Kenya. That's my, you know, that's my uh, lifelong dream. So let's do it. Uh, uh, six yeah. do you say six days to get up there? Uh, I think it's, I think Lynette will know better than me, I think, but uh, I think it's a four and a half day hike up and a a one day hike down Mount Kenya. Wow. And you don't get to the top because the top is like actual, like, like you can't go without assist, but you get to the snow. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. Well, let's, um, yeah, I'd love to collaborate more with with you guys because i think it's definitely uh yeah a nice overlapping outlook and values i think yeah cool thanks so much lawrence for making time it's really really generous we have so little time um and uh there's always a thousand things to spend it on so thank you for sharing your time with us no worries at all thanks everyone have a good day